I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners for our webinar entitled, Is Your House Making You Sneeze? A Review of Perennial Allergies. This program is supported through an educational grant from Merrick. At the conclusion of today's program, all participants will be asked to complete a brief survey. Those that complete the survey will be eligible to receive a NAPNAP Certificate of Attendance. This continuing education activity is administered by the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners, or NAPNAP, as an agency providing continuing education credit. Individuals who complete this program will be awarded one NAPNAP contact hour, of which contain 0.25 pharmacology content. Instructions on how to access the survey will be sent to the email address you use to register for today's webinar. At this point, I would now like to introduce our presenter, Jody A. Shroba, MSN, RN, CP, NP. Jody is a pediatric nurse practitioner in the Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Clinic at the Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. She has spoken both locally and nationally on allergic rightnesses, including presentations at the Missouri State School Nurse Conference and the NAPNAP and ACAAI National Conferences. Today, Ms. Schrober will present, Is Your House Making You Sneeze? a review of perennial allergies. Welcome, Ms. Roba. All right, thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, hopefully, everyone is staying nice and cool inside their work in their house. Um, I don't know about the West Coast, but here in the Midwest, we are having a heat wave right now. So it's like 100 degrees and uh, pretty miserable outside. So let's talk about something cool and refreshing like our air-conditioned homes. So my only disclosure is I am a speaker for Meta Pharmaceuticals, but nothing um, in this presentation would be um, biased by that. So our objectives are going to be to identify indoor aero allergens, the medications to treat them, and then also to discuss the environmental controls to reduce allergen exposure. So why do we want to talk about allergies? Well, allergies are the fifth leading cause of all chronic disease, and the rates have been increasing since the 80s. We'll talk in a little bit about why we think those rates are going up, um, but allergies affect as many as 40 to 50 million Americans and up to 10 to 30 percent of adults and 40 percent of children. So if you think about your practice, um, almost 50 percent of them that walk in the door are going to have some allergy component. What is the economic impact of this? Um, as you can see, this was from uh, the Mayo Clinic a few years ago, and it showed that allergies cost the United States about $14.5 billion dollars. You can see the breakdown, 1.3 were doctor's visits. Uh, the majority of it, again, obviously comes from medications, both prescription and over-the-counter, and then indirect costs um, related to your allergies. Now, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation um, found that uh, allergies cost us about $17.5 billion, so you can see that number is increasing um, in healthcare costs. There were 16 million visits to the doctor for allergy symptoms. Uh, I look at that as job security. And then more than 6 million work in school days are lost annually. So back in 2007, 2008, there was a really revolutionary study uh, that was called Allergies in America. And they first started doing this with adults. And then the following year, they turned it into a pediatric survey. And this was a telephone interview. They interviewed, they called over 35,000 homes. Um, and then reported uh, those findings um, on kids. Um, it was found that spring was the worst time for allergies. 40% of parents felt that allergies interfere with their sleep, and that was compared to only 8% of healthy children had sleep interference. 21% reported that it limited their activities, 40% that it interfered with their education. So that education component um, is pretty huge, and that goes along with the sleep. If you don't sleep well, you're not gonna perform well the next day at school. But, you know, poor sleep and feeling miserable, those kids are going to be acting out. They're going to have difficulty learning, difficulty paying attention. So not only are they disruptive and having trouble with their own education, it can be interfering to their classmates as well. And then uh, the most common um, symptoms, you can see 46% uh, reported headaches, ear, and facial pain. So it wasn't even really those classic allergy signs. And the nasal congestion was reported about 27%. Why do we think allergies are so prevalent? Um, there's a couple theories out there as to why we think. Um, the one that really kind of makes the most sense is climate change. 
Um, we're having major changes in weather patterns in precipitation and global warming. Um, you'll hear a lot of people say they don't believe in global warming, and I just can't believe that nobody believes that. I mean, if you look at how drastic our weather has changed and look at we're in a heat wave, it's June um, here in the Midwest. If you look at some of the severe weather patterns that have happened, I know today we're doing a West Coast, so I know you've had a lot of rain, especially in Southern California, mudslides, um, and crazy weather that's just really not normal to the extreme that it's coming. Last week I talked to East Coast, Superstorm Sandy, and the foot and a half of snow they got in this past winter, that's all global warming. And people think, well, that the weather's getting warmer, but in reality with global warming, you're going to have those major shifts in the weather. So it's not, yes, we are naturally getting warmer, but you're also going to see in the winter those more extreme colder temperatures and those more extreme storms. Also, with the weather rising, you're going to have an increase in CO2, and CO2 is vital for pollen production. So the more CO2 we have, more pollen we're going to have. The other thing that we need to talk about is the hygiene hypothesis. Um, we're just too clean as a society. If you sit and look at your purse, your desk, your um, work bag right now, how many of you have hand sanitizer in more than one location? I'm sitting here and I'm looking and I have four bottles of hand sanitizer right in front of me. Well, it's good to kill germs, but our body needs sometimes some germs to fight something. And so when we don't have any germs to fight, what are we going to start fighting? We're going to start fighting the natural things that we're exposed to in our environment. So trees, grasses, foods. Um, and so our body just, you know, it's it's designed to fight things. And when we're so clean, it's got nothing to fight but the things we don't want it to fight. Let's just quickly review what is an allergic reaction. So essentially what's going to happen is your body is exposed to um, proteins in pollens, in animals, in um, rodents, and uh, in molds. And your body realizes, wait a minute, I don't know about this, and I'm going to make an antibody to it. So then the next time you're exposed to it, that antibody um, is signaled and turned on, and your IgE will connect to the mast cell. That then degranulates the mast cell, and then you release all these histamine or all these mediators. Now, histamine is usually the one that most people think of, but you're also releasing kinins, leukotrienes, superoxide, free radicals, prostaglandin D. We have a pretty good handle on histamines. We got a little bit of treatment for leuko leukotrienes, but some of these other ones, we don't have any treatment. So if if some of the mediators released are not just histamine, they may not have total control of their allergy symptoms. So once those mediators are released, then those symptoms are going to immediately start. That's going to be the runny nose, the sneezing, the itching, the coughing, the eye symptoms. That's kind of how an allergic response occurs. So here I just wanted to show you the common allergens. Today we're only going to focus on those indoors, so your animals, your molds, your dust mite, your roach, and your rodents. Just a reminder, those outdoor ones also can be the molds, but then it's also going to be your trees, grasses, and weeds. So let's say that patient comes into your office and you're going to be working them up for allergies. Kind of what needs to go into your exam and your history taking to make this really an effective allergy examination? The first one, obviously, their symptoms. Um, have they tried any over-the-counter medications? As we talk about medications, you'll see almost all the allergy medications are now over-the-counter. So there's a good chance by the time they come to see you, they've tried at least one or more allergy medications that are over-the-counter and find out what their response to those has been. What other comorbidities they have. Um, if you remember with allergies, there's kind of that allergic march where we see in babies they start with the eczema or the food allergies, and then they kind of go into the asthma, and then they go into the seasonal or perennial allergies. So what are these other comorbidities do they have? And then really what's most important is taking that environmental history, which we'll go into much more detail in just a second. Then when we're talking about their symptoms, what is the frequency? Do they say it only occurs in the spring and the fall? Do they say it happens year-round? Do they say it only happens when they're around animals? That's going to really help you when you're thinking about what am I going to test? Um, when you kind of know what their exposure is. For me here in the Midwest, our, you know, our, our mold season really starts in about February, March, and we'll go until a freeze. So, you know, if they're coming to me in April and we've been raining every single day in April and they tell me that they're having symptoms, I'm going to start thinking mold allergy. They come to me in August 
um, that's our, our ragweed season. So if they're telling me their symptoms are their worst in August, I'm going to think ragweed. What symptoms do they have? Um, you'll notice under the nasal and eye symptoms, itching should really be their prominent symptom. Sure, they're going to be congested, sneezing, drainage, but there really should be an itching component when we're talking about allergies. And a lot of times they may not realize it's itching, but they may be constantly rubbing at their nose, rubbing at their eyes. Some kids will kind of make a like a tick or clearing their throat kind of noise, and that's because it's itchy or they have drainage, and that, but they don't think that it's itchy and, you know, that that's what's going on. Um, they'll say that their ears hurt. Um, they may say that they feel like their ears are full. Um, and then cough. That, um, we kind of say that not all that coughs is asthma. Uh, the cough could be related to postnasal drainage. Other symptoms that they may report, headaches is a frequently um, stated symptom. If they're telling you that their headaches are occur occurring around their, on their face or around their eyes, those are going to be more of those sinus headaches. If they're saying their headaches are occurring in the back of their head, those are really going to be more of your tension headaches and probably not related to their allergies. Facial pain, they're tired, they're miserable. Um, they may be depressed because they can't do the things like their friends are doing. They may feel isolated because they're not doing the things that their friends are doing. Or maybe they feel isolated because their best friend has a cat and they're not allowed to go to their house. And then they may be embarrassed. You know, if you're blowing your nose all the time, you know, the kids are going to be a little, you know, kind of, why are you blowing your nose all the time? Um, then we talk about the comorbidities. Do they have a lot of otitis media? Do they have recurring sinus problems, nasal polyps, sleep apnea, asthma, learning disturbances, or oral facial abnormalities? So going back to the um, environmental history, First thing right off the bat, you want to ask them what type of dwelling do they live in? Is it a house? Is it a condominium? Is it a duplex? Is it a mobile home? Um, you know, maybe they live in an apartment. So those are really important things to know because that will affect maybe some of the indoor allergens that they may have exposure to. What type of heating do they have? Window units, central air, furnace, wood burning stoves? Um, you know, some people up in the northwest and uh, up in the north may not have air conditioning, so they may sleep with their windows open. So those are really important um, information to get. I saw a patient this morning, and the dad says, we don't have air conditioning. And I said, oh, do you sleep with the windows open? He says, oh, no, we have window units. So, again, you know, my first thought was, oh, my gosh, they have no air conditioning, but it said they had window units. So you kind of want to get a little better history of that. What pets do they have in the home? And you really need to sometimes think outside the box of other than just the cat and the dog. Um, if they are rural, you know, do they have cows? Do they have horses? Um, even inner city or anybody, do they have rabbits, hamsters, um, guinea pigs? So really anything with fur, you're going to want to know if they have. Do they have goats? You know, that's not one that we see a lot, but there may be people with goats. Um, what smoke exposure or other irritants in the home? Um, you know, do people smoke? And sometimes you really got to tease that out because you'll say, is there smoke exposure? And they'll say no. But then you kind of have to then say, is there smoke exposure outside the home? Is there smoke exposure in the car? Um, do they burn incense? Do they have, um, you know, the air fresheners that you plug into the wall? Um, what type of flooring do they have? Carpeting, uh, hardwood, linoleum, tile? Um, because, again, the carpet is going to be a big factor if we're talking a dust mite allergy. Do they have a basement? Um, you Here in the Midwest, basements are prevalent. I'm not sure on the coast that basements are as readily available. Um, but if they do have a basement, is it finished, unfinished, or dry, or damp? Um, and the reason why you want to ask that is, you know, do they have mold growing that maybe they don't know, but they can smell it? If it's a damp basement, I'm sure there's probably mold growing. And then again, have there been any water problems? Next, you're going to move on to that physical exam. Um, obviously, when you look in the nose, you're, you're looking for the pale, swollen turbinates. Um, if it's allergic, they are going to be that kind of pale pink, blue, purple kind of color. If it's beefy red, it's probably more of an infection than it is necessarily allergies, unless it's a kid that's just a constant picker and they're just messing with their nose. But really look for that pale color. Um, the one in the upper right is um, Denny Morgan line. So those little wrinkles underneath his eyes. I mean, this is a very young kid. He shouldn't have wrinkles, but you see he's got those little um, creases under his eyes. Um, the little boy in the lower left-hand corner, he's doing what we call the allergic salute. 
um, where they constantly, their nose itches, so they're constantly rubbing it upward. Some kids will rub it side to side. But either way, then across the bridge of their nose, they'll get like a little dark line because they've constantly pressed on it like that. And then the last picture, of course, the allergic shiners. Um, she, this is a really good picture of it. She also has the Denny Morgan lines. You can see the um, creases under her eyes. So now you've done a history and you've decided you need to test um, the child for allergies. Obviously, me being in an allergy clinic, we will do um, skin prick tests. Usually in primary care, they're looking more to do the blood test. Um, we prefer the skin prick tests. We do not do intradermals. Intradermals actually cut the skin, um, so there is quite a bit of pain involved in it, um, and we feel that the skin prick is just as effective and not quite as invasive. The other way to do it would be obviously a blood test. Now, when you are talking um, about testing with the blood, um, the really the system that is used now is called ImmunoCap. If anyone's been in practice for a little while, they may remember a term called RAST. Um, and that form of testing is really not used anymore. You'll still hear people call it that, but it really is an ImmunoCap. The other way that allergies can be tested is a nasal smear for eosinophils, and that's really not used. Uh, last week, some um, questions came up about medication and testing. With a blood test, medications do not interfere with testing. So um, if they are on antihistamine, uh, no worries. Um, obviously, a skin test, you would need to be off your antihistamine. And then the other question that came up was about um, oral steroids. And those usually do not affect testing. It will not affect a blood test. And um, in terms of a skin test, if it has been a short course, um, or a low dose, it usually doesn't affect it. But if they're on, um, you know, if they have some sort of chronic disease that they're on long-term steroid use, um, you may not want to skin test them. The other thing that sometimes we find with skin testing is um, sometimes kids that are very tan, so I'm um, talking to you West Coast girls, um, if they're really, really tan, sometimes um, the, the tan skin may have trouble um, reacting as well. So. If you're putting the, your controls on and it's a, a very tanned individual, you may find it, it doesn't react. So that may be another reason to do um, a blood test. For us, the skin testing is preferred. It's a little bit lower cost. We can get the answer while they're in the clinic. Um, there is a good sensitivity, and we can test a wide range of antigens. Um, a blood test would be used, again, for those um, kiddos that can't come off their antihistamine. Um, infants that you know won't sit still for a whole uh, skin test, but you know you could get a quick blood test from them. The uncooperative patient, um, those with extensive skin disease, so really bad eczema, um, or dermatographism. And um, just a quick reminder, dermatographism is where um, they have that very sensitive skin that even any pressure to the skin will cause it to hive up. Um, so there are those cool kids, if you Google dermatographism, you can see like pictures where people have like written their name on, on individuals' backs and it will hive up with the pattern that you've made. Um, also, you would not want a skin test if there's a risk for anaphylaxis. So here's kind of what a skin testing tray looks like on the left, and then here's a little boy that's getting the skin testing. So you can, you know, who knows what he's actually doing because they cut his head off this picture, but usually it's... It's a little uncomfortable, but there is no pain involved in it, and most kids will sit still for it. And then here are some results. The one on the left is essentially a negative test. Um, you can see that K2, um, he does have a little bit of a reaction that's actually a dog. And then the ones that say C and H, these are our um, positive controls. For, so for this test to be valid, those have to respond. And then the uh, picture of the boy on the right, obviously extremely allergic. When we're looking at these and measuring them, you first measure the bump in the middle, which is called the wheel, and then you measure the flare, which is the redness around it. Now you can see he has such large reactions that they're kind of all spilling together, and the nurses just have to do their very best to figure out where the, the border may be between the two. And one point I want to make is that when you're doing testing, and this includes allergy as well as food allergy testing, you're measuring sensitization. So you're measuring that the body has made an antibody to a allergen. Now, just because you're sensitized does not mean that you're allergic. You have to have symptoms go along with it. So 
prime example is, you know, they have like the skin testing I showed you where he had a response to the dog, but then maybe I got the history from him and they have a dog in the house and he's fine with the dog. He has no symptoms. So we would say that he's sensitized. Now, let's say I say, well, well, how are you around a dog? And he says, oh, my gosh, every time I touch a dog, I get a hive. That is a dog allergy. So when you're doing testing and you're interpreting the results, they're sensitized. Unless you have that history to match it, then you can call it an allergy. That's kind of a hard, complicated um a skill to learn. I, I don't think um, we see it a lot in like the residents and the med students. But that's not really taught in medical school and really nursing school. It's not taught that much either. That there really is a difference between a sensitization of a test and being allergic. So next, we're going to talk about um, why do we treat? Well, obviously to make them more comfortable. But our goals of treatment should include um, better sleep, ability to perform normal activities school and work attendance, and then obviously participation in sports and leisure activities. So our treatment options obviously include uh, medications, immunotherapy, and then avoidance techniques. So I wanted to show this picture because this is what our families have to deal with. Now I can look at this picture and I can tell you just about what every single one of these bottles are uh, from this picture. But imagine being a family and trying to go and try to buy a medication for your child, and you don't know which one to buy. And, you know, this one will say great for allergies, but this one says great for the nose. And it can be very confusing and complicated when this is what's readily available over the counter for our families. So when we talk about the antihistamines, um, with the exception of the levocetirazine, all of those are now over the counter. The... Um, First generation is going to be your diphenhydramine, your bromfenaramine, and your chlorpheniramine. These are great drugs. Um, they're oldies but goodies. Um, just because there's something newer out doesn't mean that what was out before is not good. These are just sedating. So using them during the daytime may not be beneficial, but at nighttime these are really still excellent drugs to use. Then your second generation is going to be your loratadine, your cetirizine, your fexofenadine, and um, in those, again, second generation, less sedating. The levocetirazine is also a second generation, but it is prescription only. These medications, um, you know, the, the first generation need to be um, prescribed more frequently, usually every four to six hours, where your second generation tend to be once a day treatment. However, we do off-label use them quite a bit and we'll use them twice a day, especially when they're in the peak of the season. You know, most meds that say 24-hour, um, let's be realistic, you're getting about maybe 16 to 18 hours of benefit from it. So a second dose at nighttime um, would not be unheard of or switching over to one of the first generations that they can use at bedtime. Your decongestants are going to be your Sudafed, your phenylephrine, and your oxymetazoline. Um, Sudafed, again, um, are the uh, decongestant pills. They're behind the counter but not prescription. Um, and then your phenylephrine and oxymetazoline, you find those more over-the-counter. Um, the oxymetazoline would be afrin, so the decongestant nose spray. When we move on to the nasal sprays, um, again, a lot of these medications are over-the-counter. Um, so in your nose sprays, you're going to have your uh, triamcinolones, your flutigazones, your budesonides, bometazones, beclomethazones, seclesonide, and then your combination product of flutigazone and azelastine. The four that I put the picture of, um, I am not biased to these. Those are just the ones that are over the counter. So I just wanted you to be familiar with what the packaging might look like. Um, patients aren't real good about remembering the name of their medication, but they can usually tell you the color. So if they come in and they tell you a brown bottle, then you know you're probably dealing with flutigazone um, or the rhinocort. Um, where they tell you a white bottle, blue top, then you automatically know that you're probably dealing with the nasocort or a nasonex. So um, that's why I kind of put those three pictures up there. Your antihistamine nose sprays, these are still prescription. It's going to be your azelastine and your olopatidine. Um, these work great for those runny, sneezy, drippy kind of kids, where your corticosteroid nose sprays are going to work well for the congestion, swelling, and inflammation. And Dimista came around to try to combat both of those. Those antihistamine nose sprays 
um, do have a bit of an aftertaste. I'm not sure how many of you have ever tried them before. I warn parents that there is an aftertaste with these medications because we all know if you have a bad experience the first time, your compliance with the medication is is gone. So I usually do tell them there's a little bit of an aftertaste, brush your teeth, um, drink something, eat something, because you're going to find these medications work, and so we don't want them to have a bad experience using them. The other medication that we will prescribe is nasal crom, so your chromalin sodium. That works really great um, for quick pre-treatment kind of situations. So those kids that maybe have a horse allergy but um, go to the barn or your farm kids or the ones that their best friend has the cat and the dog and they want to go over to their house. Uh, this is a medication that can be done about 10 to 15 minutes before exposure and can give them some relief um, while they're um, at the offending area. In terms of your eye drops, again, I am not playing favorites. The first two, the Alloa and Zatador, are both over-the-counter. Um, so those tend to be the ones that we see families most frequently buy. Um, so again, if they tell you they bought the orange box, you'll know that that's Zatador. Um, they did great marketing on that because nobody else has an orange box. So you know right off the bat, orange box, you know what you're dealing with. Your prescriptions are going to be your uh, Patanol, Pataday. Now the difference between those two, Patanol is a twice a day, Pataday is a once a day. And the newest um, player to that game is the Pazio, and that is also, I believe, a once a day medication. Um, you also have Optivar, um, your Obcon A, your Nafcon A, which are all available over the counter. Other medications that you will find, uh, your leukotriene modifiers, again, that's monolucast is the one that's used most frequently in kiddos. It um, works well for the treatment of allergies and asthma. I will tell you, as a first-line treatment, I do not use this for allergies. Um, you're really going to get more bang for your buck using an antihistamine. If they have asthma and allergies, then this may be the first-line treatment you want to consider. But um, for Allergies alone, I usually don't go to this one first. Um, it did lose its patent in 2012, so it is generic. So that is the, the bonus of that medication. And then in those kids that are really bad, we do recommend a short course of um, oral steroids. So we usually dose it at 1 to 2 milligrams per kilo for about 2 to 3 days. Um, and that will really help with that inflammation. I tend to use this the most in the spring. Um, around here, our tree pollen is really potent, so we tend to see the most um, swelling issues in the spring. If they're having a lot of eye symptoms and you're finding the eye drops aren't working, um, we do send our kids to an optometrist, ophthalmologist for a full exam and then possibly steroid eye drops. But we really don't recommend those unless they've had a full eye exam. And then the last thing I want to mention, which is not on the slide, are sinus rinses. Um, these are fantastic. We do recommend these um, quite frequently. Um, we'll say to do them once a day during their allergy season, during um, peak days of their allergy season. Even when they have a cold, we recommend it. We tend to do the sinus bottle versus, say, the neti pot. Um, and I don't know what everybody's personal experience is. Since I can't see everybody's smiling faces, I can't see what people are saying. But um, we find the neti pot extremely difficult to use. I tried it once, and I was like, I have to put my head where and do what? And the sinus rinse bottles are so much easier because it's just a squirt bottle. You go up one side of the nose and out the other side, and it's very easy for kids to do. So a lot of our kids will tell them do it when they're in the shower, and then all the nasties can just go down the drain when they're in the shower. Uh, the next thing we're going to quickly talk about is just immunotherapy. Um, immunotherapy has been around for, um, believe it or not, over 100 years. Um, it is for um, allergies, allergic component of asthma, and then stinging insects. It is a buildup process. You start with this green vial, which is very weak, and then you get more concentrated as you move down the line until you get to the red vial, which is a one-to-one -one, um, concentrate. You are on allergy shots for three to five years. You initially start as a buildup where you're coming weekly, and then by the time you're in that maintenance dose, you do just do shots once a month. Um, they have uh, great efficacy, um, and there are some uh, short-term and long-term benefits um, to doing allergy shots. So if medication hasn't been helpful, that is something to definitely think about um, doing for the patients. And then the newest player um, to the game is uh, the sublingual immunotherapy. 
Currently in the United States, we have uh, Grass Tech, which is for grass allergy, and we have Ragwitech, which is for your ragweed allergy. Um, and uh, there's also Oralair, which um, is also for um, your grass allergy. The Grass Tech is to five years and older. The Ragwitech is to 12 years and older. In Europe, they currently have dust mite um, sublingual, and they are working on getting it approved here in America. Hopefully, we'll get it soon. Um, I think that would be a really great thing to have. Um, usually, when you do um, slit, you start it about 12 weeks prior to the start of the allergy season. Now, there's two ways you can do it. You can just start it 12 weeks before, and then once your season is over, you stop it. Or there's now the recommendation that you can just give it year-round for three years, and then they say that you've completed, essentially, immunotherapy. So very similar to the shots, um, the um, skit, um, after three years, they're saying that you've done a full course. Um, they do recommend the first dose be given in the provider's office, and you're monitored for 30 minutes after, just in case um, that there's a reaction. They do recommend everyone gets um, an injectable epinephrine um, that is on um, slit. We've been doing it for a couple years here. I have not had, knock on wood, anybody with any reaction more serious than just an itchy mouth. Remember, you're giving them what they're allergic to in their mouth. So itching tends to be the most common um, side effect. Next, we're going to kind of talk about um, the indoor allergens um, and how to avoid them and eliminate them in the house. This was a great um, picture that came from National Jewish, and it just talks about 10 things that you can do in your house to curb um, indoor allergens. So um, I will give this to families just to kind of remind them of some of the things that they can do in their house. So the first one we're going to talk about is dust mite. You can see in the middle there is a picture of him. He's a, a microscopic eight-legged arthropod. Um, they feed on our skin cells, um, fungus, yeast, and bacteria. So we do tend to see these levels increase during the summer when there's high humidity. And then once the humidity gets low, they usually don't survive very well. Um, dust mites can be found in 84% of homes. Now, the one thing that everyone says to me, oh, we don't have dust in our home. And I say, that's amazing. What are you using to clean your house? Because everybody has dust in their home, let's be honest. But um, that is not where dust mites live. They're going to live in our carpeting, our bedding, our upholstered furniture. Because remember, they live on our skin cells. So they're going to live where we lay. So it's really important that we talk about those dust mite covers um, on their bedding, washing everything appropriately, because that's where they're going to be. You're not going to find them on your kitchen surface. Um, another thing to remind people is clothing. You know, if you have those clothes that you wear maybe once or twice before you take it to the dry cleaner, or maybe you wore it once and then it sits in your closet for a while um, without being cleaned, they're going to have dust mites. You're going to find dust mites in those. Now, we do know that dust mites... Um, can be a trigger for atopic dermatitis. So in 35% of children with atopic dermatitis actually had um, live mites. So they actually found it on their skin and their clothing and their bedding. So remember, if they are really bad eczema and they're scratching and they're digging, now they have kind of open, you know, um, areas to their skin, those mites can crawl in there. Um, or they're going to live near there because that's where they're shedding all their skin. So on the little, little kids, you know, that you're concerned that may have allergies, and but they just, you know, they're only like one year old, two years old, think dust mites, especially in those with eczema. Also remember, if the child, where is the child living? Like they're either sleeping in their crib or they may be crawling around on the floor. So again, the two main areas where dust mites live. So um, really think the dust mites, um, allergen when you're dealing with those little eczema kiddos. And then again, interventions to decrease mite exposure have led to improvement in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So I'm going to get all fancy on you, and I'm going to call dust mite by its real name, which is Derpy 10. And um, if you remember back to biology class, those first three letters are the genus, this middle letter is the species, and then the number is its order of the allergen. Now, Derpy 10 contains some, a protein called tropomyosin. Tropomyosin cross-reacts with crustacean and roaches. 
So you're going to find about 5 to 15% of those that have a dust mite allergy may actually also be sensitized to crustaceans. So your shellfish, they may also have a roach allergy. So a lot of those may go hand in hand. So, um, you know, the individual that's dust mite allergic and then they told you that they ate shellfish and they got an itchy mouth, you got to think probably a cross-reactivity with that tropomyosin. And the other thing that's kind of been kind of a recent um, discussion is that um, dust mites can actually get into grain flour. So when you have those big silos, big processing pla um, plants, you can actually find dust mite. And so there have been systemic reactions reported to dust mite allergic individuals after ingestion of grain flour. So um, we had a patient, one of my colleagues did, and every time he ate the certain cereal um, from the same box, he would have a reaction. And, you know, again, we, we couldn't test anything more than what was he allergic to, but the only, you know, he wasn't allergic to wheat. He wasn't allergic to, you know, what uh, tree nuts or any food allergen, So that, but he was allergic to dust mites. So um, we do believe that he was reacting to possibly dust mites in his food. So if you are not completely and totally grossed out by all of the talk of dust mites in, in food um, invasion, um, so sorry, because you guys are eating lunch on the West Coast, so... Um, and the other thing to think about is that cooking doesn't always denature that mite allergen. So that grain flour that's baked, there may still actually be some um, tropomyosin in it. So how do we avoid the dust mites? Cover our mattress and pillow in those airtight covers. And when we say airtight covers, make sure it's the ones that fully zip, not the ones that have the elastic around the bottom. And you want to get it on your pillow too. Wash everything in hot water and use the dryer because the heat will kill them. Keep the indoor humidity between 35 and 50%, um, which if you live here in the Midwest, um, we're really humid right now. So um, I guarantee our humidity levels are well above 50%. Uh, vacuum with an allergen bag. Um, for those of you in Colorado, you probably don't have dust mites quite like we do. With the higher elevations, your humidity is less, so there may not be quite as much dust mite. Um, remove carpeting in the bedroom if that's an option. That's a big expense. I have had some families do it because the dust mite allergen was so bad and their eczema was so bad. And do dust your surfaces regularly. Not that you're going to find a ton of them in there, but keeping, keeping a clean house is good. So moving on to the molds, um, here are really the four major mold allergens that we talk about, Aspergillus, Alternaria, Penicillium, and Cladosporium. The Aspergillus that is actually growing on a corn um, kernel, the Alternaria is growing on a, um, a pepper, and then the penicillium you can see growing on the orange classform. I couldn't find a good food picture, so that was just of some leaves. This is a fantastic handout that was given by a company um, called Achu Allergy. And um, when I went to look for it the other day when I was getting this presentation ready, it's not available anymore, but it's so fantastic I wanted you guys to have it. So if you want to print it off and give it to families, it's a great resource. Um, I was not expecting anybody to read it off the screen today, but I just wanted you to have it. Um, so when we're talking about mold, how do we avoid it? Um, so those kids that are mold allergic, um, you know, raking the leaves in the fall may not be the best chore for them. Um, getting that big giant pile of leaves and jumping in it, again, maybe not the best idea. Um, keep your bathrooms, kitchens, basements as dry as possible. Make sure there's, you know, exhaust vents and fans um, to keep that moisture out of the air. Um, clean bathrooms, kitchens, basements regularly. If there's any water damage, fix it immediately. Keep that humidity between that 30 to 50%. We have um, an environmental um, health team at our hospital, and they go out and do home assessments in homes that are with children that have chronic disease, whether it be allergy, asthma. Um, we even do it for some of our oncology patients, just to make sure that the home environment um, is a safe one for them. So these are pictures from an actual home um, you can see the mold growing on the wall. And then in the bottom picture, again, there's mold growing on the wall. And right in front of the picture of the wall, that is a toy truck. So um, we really hope that this child was not down there playing um, with his toys right in front of that big old mold patch. Okay, if your skin wasn't crawling, let's talk about some roaches. So there are 4,500 species of roaches. Um, the two most common indoor roaches are going to be your German and your American. 
And believe it or not, the German cockroach is the most common in the United States. Now, I do not know if the American cockroach is more common in German, uh, in Germany, um, but for some reason the German cockroach is what we have. At the bottom you can kind of see the picture. The German is the much smaller one, Oriental, and they're American. In some um, South American and Central American countries, um, keeping roaches as a pet is actually quite popular. Um, uh, there's not there is not enough money in the world for me to um willingly have a roach in my house um so when we're talking about roaches again we're going to get all fancy with the blodgy one um that is a major allergen of roaches and that is found in cockroach frass which frass means fecal material and that's what's really allergenic so when you say you're allergic to roaches you're actually allergic to the dropping of roaches as opposed to say the actual roach itself um, and remember when we talked about the dust mites, that um, the roach also carries tropomyosin, so you have that cross-reactivity with the dust mites and your shellfish. Cockroaches tend to be found more in the southern latitudes because they like the warmth and the moisture. You don't see them much with the cold. Um, they are scavengers, and they um, have a taste for starch and fat. Um, so again, they're going to get into your garbage. Um, if you see any dead cockroaches, egg casings, exoskeletons, or again the frass, that means you actually have active cockroach. They did not just leave that and go away. They are still there and prevalent. So this picture can, was taken from an exterminator, and you can see all of that as roach frass. So um, this is a house with definite infestation. Um, I'm going to go through some of these roach avoidance real quickly so we have enough time for questions. Um, so I'm not going to read everything on this slide, but blocking their entry um, into the home, um, making sure there's not food and water accessible to them. Eliminate shelter. Don't, don't keep a lot of cardboard boxes. Don't keep a lot of clutter. Don't keep trash cans close to your house. Um, eliminate the contaminant sources. Um, and then um, obviously cleaning, using the mattress covers um, are all good ideas. So moving on to our critters, um, we have our rodents. Um, and these can be found everywhere. So even people that say they do not have a mouse infestation, 82% of homes will actually have detectable mouse allergen. Now again, when I, we talked about where they live is important because you're going to find the highest concentration of mouse allergen in older homes, high-rise apartments, mobile homes, low-income housing. So again, if they tell you that they live inner city in a high-rise apartment, um, you may want to be concerned that there may be mouse exposure. So how do we reduce our mouse exposure? Um, obviously, get rid of them. As soon as you know that you have an infestation, um, eliminate that. Again, removing their um, entry into the house, their food, their water, their shelter um, is a good way to get rid of them. Um, rodent traps, um, down below um, I have, this was from Google Images, this super cute little mouse with a helmet on trying to get the cheese. Um, now, a lot of times people will think, well, if I get a cat, um, I will get rid of my mouse problem. And um, not necessarily true, and then you do run the risk of then you become sensitized to cats. So really traps and um, rodent sides are um, the better way to go on that. And then we talk about our beloved cat and dog. Um, this picture is of my four-legged babies. Um, my dog is a very elderly dog and my um, cute little kitten who's still um, very wild. Um, but we love our cats and dogs in this country. There's an estimated 93 million cat owners, 77 million dog owners. And as you can see, that it's not just having one animal, that we have a lot of animals. 56% own more than one cat, 25% own more than one dog. So when we talk about pets, if you leave with nothing else from this lecture, there is no hypoallergenic animal. So um, just remember that. Just because they might shed less than others, they are not hypoallergenic. So as you can see, when we talk about the cat allergen, Fel D1 is a major allergen, and that's what 90% of cat allergic individuals are sensitized to. That's found in the cat's skin and their hair follicles. So again, even if your cat didn't have any fur, they still have skin. 
it's also produced um, in their salivary glands, sebaceous and anal glands. So again, you cannot remove skin and glands, so a cat is still going to be able to produce um, the Feldy one. When we talk about dogs, it's CAN F1, and 52% are allergic to the CAN F1. Um, and those, again, are secreted um, largely from the sebaceous glands, so it's not even their fur. Um, you'll find it in their fur, but you also find it in their dander and their saliva. So um, really the non-shedding dogs is just not going to be allergen-free. There is some thought that exposure to animals before three months of age may reduce your likelihood of developing um, sensitization, um, but there's just not a, enough risk reduction to justify that statement. Um, we will find a lot of people, almost by having the dog in the home, they've kind of, you know, um, desensitized themselves to it. So the family, you know, you do that testing and they're sensitized to dog, but they say, well, we have a dog in the home. And I said, well, you're probably you know, kind of giving yourself natural immunotherapy with the dog. But when you go to buy another dog, that may be where your problem comes about. So I always tell families if they're thinking of getting an animal and they do show sensitivity to cat or dog, spend some time with that animal at the breeder, at the shelter, um, at the pet store before you bring it in the house. Because, you know, once you bring it in the house, it's really hard to rehome those animals. So it really is of, of our duty to tell them, you know, do a little pre-work before you bring that animal home. So pet avoidance, um, removal of the animal from the home in the classroom. Um, I've been doing allergy for nine years, and I have only told one family to remove their pet. So um, I will work with these families as hard as I can to get them to be able to keep the pet in their home because, again, it's really hard to rehome these animals. I have had a few families that have given up their pets to other family members um, and that's worked for them. It, after the cat is out of the home, it can actually take six months for that dander um, to denature. So although the cat is gone, you may still find cat allergen in the home. Um, if the pet is in the home and they really cannot get rid of it, um, possibly thinking kenneling it, um, not letting it sleep in the bedroom. That is the worst thing you can do. It's got to stay out of the bedroom. Now washing. Um, there's a little bit of controversy about the washing um, you know, it, it may help short term, but there really is no lasting effects from washing an animal. And any of you that have cats um, know that washing a cat might be the most miserable experience ever. Um, vacuuming with a high efficiency or central vacuum. Um, if they really want a pet, tell them to get a fish. Um, even get a bird. There is some allergy to bird, but not nearly as much as there is to cat and dog. Um, making sure that there's ill air filtration and that you're regularly cleaning those furnace filters. And cleaning those furnace filters are going to help really with all of these indoor allergens. I didn't really touch on it much, but it's going to help with the mold, the dust mite, um, the pet animals. Um, so that's another thing to remind parents. And then treat the reservoirs. So, um, you know, what if the dog goes outside um, or you have an outdoor cat that you allow in at nighttime, well, they're just bringing in all of that outdoor pollen and bringing it in. Also, if you allow the animals on the furniture, um, you're going to have um, the allergen on the furniture as well. So in conclusion, um, it's uh, kind of four simple things. Um, identify what you're allergic to. Avoid the allergen if possible. Environmental controls to eliminate the exposure and then medications to treat. So. Um, I got about 10 minutes. I talked a little bit faster this week because I wanted to leave time for questions. So I'll turn it back over to the moderator to um, do questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jody. Audience members, just a reminder, if you would like to ask a question today, go ahead and click on that Q&A tab on the top of your screen and then select Ask New Question. Uh, we did get a few questions that came in from our audience members. The first one here says, when do, you, when do you recommend is a good starting age to have a child get allergy testing, and what is the youngest that you will do testing on? Okay, so great question. Um, we have tested really at any age, um, but if you're talking seasonal allergies, so you think they're allergic to those trees, grasses, weeds, you really want to think about really that four to six age range, because remember, you have to have exposure. So that one-year-old that comes in and the mom says they have seasonal allergies, it's not possible. They haven't even lived through all of the seasons and then being re-exposed to them. 
So if you're thinking outdoor allergens, I usually don't test before the age of three. If you're talking indoor allergens, if it is a kid with moderate to severe eczema, we'll test early because, again, that constant exposure to that dust mite can occur very rapidly. So you can even have your six-month-old that's already sensitized to dust mite. So it's kind of thinking about what's the presentation as to what age you should test. And even in those two- and three-year-olds that the mom says, every time I have outdoor allergies, so does my child. And I'll say, well, you know what, they're probably developing allergies. They're at a young age, and if we test, it may come back with something, but it also may not because we haven't had enough time. So we'll usually talk about let's start trying some antihistamine, see how they do, and retesting when they get a little bit older. If the parent is adamant and they want testing done, I will do it. Um, You know, and I'll, I'll remind them, you know, your child hasn't lived long enough, so some of these seasonal allergies may not show up, but we're happy to test. And you'd be surprised at how many parents still want that one-year-old tested, and and we do it, and there's usually nothing there. But, um, you know, it's a a request the family wants, and I'm happy to help them out with that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Next question from one of our audience members says, how long does the patient have to be off the antihistamine before skin allergy testing? Great question. So they all vary. So when you're talking first-generation antihistamines, so your your diphenhydramines, chlorpheniramines, bromphenaramines, um, they actually only need 72 hours. If you're talking um, your Claritins, your Zyrtex, those need to be off for five days. And if you're talking your fexofenadine, um, that actually needs to be off for seven days. Um, Just uh, out of side note, I... Um, we allergy tested me, and um, after being off of Allegra for six days, I, my histamine was still blocked. So we actually had to wait until 10 days off to test me on fexofenadine. But the st- usually the standard is seven days. The other thing you do want to think about, which we don't see a lot in the younger population, but if you do work with teenagers um, or you know, you're in a family practice, um, SSRIs can actually um, interfere with testing. So if they are on any antidepressants, um, you may want to consider doing a a blood test versus a skin test. Great. Thank you. Uh, Next question is uh, similar. It says, how long should someone try an allergy medication before trying a new one if if the first one doesn't work? Well, there's no magical answer on this question. It, it's a good question, and it, it's a question I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, you know, the first thing you want to to make sure is that are you really treating allergies? Um, you know, because if they're a non-allergic individual, so you do their IgE testing and it's negative, you're going to find that the fexofenadines and the claritins um, don't do much. You still may find that, that the diphenhydramines and the cetirizines help a little bit because they do have a drying principle to it. If they really truly are allergic and you know you're on the cetirizine and it's not working after you know a couple weeks, I'll say you know we can try a different one. Um, if you're going through insurance, um, you really have to run the gamut. You got to go through your loratadine, your cetirizine before they'll even give you the fexofenadine or the levocetirizine. So. If that's the case where I'm trying to get through insurance, maybe I'll only do like a week on each one before we move through to the next one. Um, But there really is no magic number, but that was a really good question. Great. Our next question here says, how long do you continue to treat with medications? Is it only when symptoms are present or or should they be preventative during season? So, again, another great question. You guys are having great questions today. Um, Usually we'll tell you to treat during your season, so even preventatively. So if you are a tree pollen, we'll have you treat for the entire six weeks of tree pollen season. The indoor allergens are much harder because you can have that year-round exposure to the indoor allergen. If it's a situation where it's like a cat and a dog and they're not in the home, then I tell the families only to treat, like to pre-treat before exposure, and then they can do a second dose after the exposure is over if they need it. But really, we do tell them to go ahead and treat every day during their season. 
Great, thank you. Uh, next question from our audience member says, when initiating allergy therapy, do you have a pre uh, preference for nasal spray versus an anti antihistamine? I thought the current guidelines recommend initiating therapy with nasal steroids. So again, a good, good question. Um, my preference would be to start with a nasal spray. If their symptom is their nose, why not hit it right where the problem is? So if they're coming in and they're saying that they're runny, they're sneezy, they're itchy, they're congested, then I do recommend that nose spray. And I'll say this is going to give you more bang for your buck. A lot of kids are averse to nose sprays. And so you're finding that, um, you know, popping a pill, taking a teaspoon of medication is more conducive to their life and to the family getting medication in them. So you do find that oral antihistamines do tend to be the starting point, and that's more out of convenience. Um, you know, I tell families when you're on an oral antihistamine, you have to take the medication, get into the stomach, absorb through the bloodstream before you're going to start seeing symptoms or symptom resolution, you know, where that nose spray, you're hitting it right at the source right away. So my preference would be to start with a nasal spray, but um, when you're talking about children, sometimes an oral antihistamine is more effective just for giving the medication. Great. Next question from one of our audience members says, "How long can they start trying? Na how old can should they be when they start trying nasal saline rinses? And are nasal saline sprays effective for toddlers?" Okay. Good question. So we start saline spray with bulb suction um, immediately. So uh, at any age that comes in to me and they're saying that they are having nasal symptoms in the teeny weeny ones, we'll tell them to get that saline nose spray and suck it back out with a bulb syringe. In terms of like the sinus rinse bottles that actually have the, the salt solution, I think the youngest age I have done is a three-year-old. Again, remember, Kids don't like to put anything up their nose other than their fingers. So it is a hard sell to do the nose sprays and the saline rinse on some of these younger kids. Um, I'm not sure if you go on to the company that makes those sinus rinses what their preferred age um, limit is, but um, we are really a big advocate of cleaning out the nose. So in any way that you can do it, we would recommend um, with the saline. Thank you. Next question here says, is it safe to give Claritin or Zyrtec daily for dust allergies, or should we consider immunotherapy? So these are, again, fabulous questions. Um, Claritin and Zyrtec are completely safe for dust allergies, um, and you can use those. They're going to be effective, but you're going to have even be more effective if you're doing the environmental controls. Um, the medicine's going to help you, but if you're still sleeping on your mattress that has a dust mite infestation, the medicine doesn't really matter. So if they are really doing um, all of those environmental controls and they're on the Claritin and Zyrtec daily and they're still having symptoms, then I would go over to the immunotherapy. If it's a kid that has asthma or atopic dermatitis that seems to be um, triggered by a dust mite allergy, then I would go to immunotherapy a little bit faster. Um, but they can be on these medications daily. They are um, pretty safe medications when you're using them with, in compliance with what the bottle directions tell you. Great, thank you. Next question here says, how accurate is the immunocap? Um, so I don't have like a, a percentage for you. Um, we do find immunocap to be uh, really accurate and pretty comparable to a skin test. Now, um, when you are talking blood tests, and this wasn't something I brought up earlier, um, but those with eczema, their IgE levels are naturally going to be higher. So um, it is not uncommon if you do a blood test, an immunocap on someone with eczema, to see their total IgE levels 1,000, um, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, and that'd be normal for someone with eczema. Uh, even uh, I've seen a child with a really bad eczema, and their IgE will be up into the 10,000s. And this isn't a situation where we're getting into hyper-IgE syndrome. They really just make a lot of IgE. In that case, then your immunocap may not be as accurate. 
again, if your total IgE is elevated, then those specific IgE levels are also going to be elevated. So we see that play more into the food allergy than we do to the environmental allergy. Usually the environmental allergies are pretty true um, to the test, but you may see this especially with the food allergies, and that's why I kind of brought in that sensitization point that although they're showing sensitization on the immunocap, it may not be a true allergy. Um, but when we're talking environmental, the, the immunocap's really good. Great, thank you. That does look like we are out of time for questions. So on behalf of NAPNAP, I would like to give special thanks to Jody Taroba for her commitment in developing today's presentation. We'd also like to thank all of you for participating in today's webinar. Bill will be providing NAPNAP with a list of those who attended today. As a reminder, we'll be sending out an email to all those who participated in today's webinar with instructions on how to access the survey and your completion certificate. If you have any questions regarding today's webinar, please call NAPNAP at the at this number, 1-877-662-7627. Again, that is 1-877-662-7627. You can also visit us on the web at www.napnap.org or email us at ce at napnap.org. Again, thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you all have a great rest of your day, and at this time you may now disconnect.